Hey, Arthur, what's up? Hey, hey. A lot of people joining in. That's exciting. What's up, Anton? We lost your sound. Yeah, that, that's because I put myself on mute. Oh. I say that I'm, I'm really excited and intrigued about the project, so I decided to join to see. You know, it's like I'm interested to see the, the features you're going to get there. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a first formalized effort to nice. create some, some form of product or service that Perfect. is apparently yeah. already useful. So we just need to, to build the, the user interface and all kinds of things. Wow. Connect for it. All right, let's give it a That's exciting, more. yeah. We already have 13 people. Nice. How's everyone doing? All fine. Hello from Greece. Hey, Despina, I'm really glad you're joining us. Me too, me too. Congratulations for the last uh, evolution. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's definitely an evolution. All right. Let's see if we have um, all the people that uh, we listed out in the agenda. least majority of those. Let's see if Dan Sosa is joining. All right, just give an extra ping and I think we can, we can start. So thanks everyone for jumping in today. Um, busy Monday, I'm sure for, for every, every one of us, but this is an exciting call because we finally have an opportunity to formalize a very focused effort to work on the continu continuation of all the efforts that we've been uh, kind of creating for the past four months now. It's crazy to, to even imagine that it's been four months, but that's the reality of this uh, crazy COVID world. And uh, all of the things that we started with, uh, being Kaggle round one submission, Kaggle round two submission, and all the uh, additional projects that accumulated through different interesting initiatives, they all have ability to, um, to be integrated into this centralized AI powered literature review product. And um, essentially we had a call last week where we realized that we don't have to build something so crazy and so complex. Uh, there is no need for um, like some discovery engine that uh, knows everything and, and helps millions of people. And we should start from a very, very uh, narrow use case. And that use case is biomedical researchers primarily focused on lung related research. And uh, that includes many things like the, the actual work on the receptors, the, um, the work um, that researchers are doing to analyze certain substances, the work um, that I personally have little knowledge of, but Dan Sosa is, is the person on the team that who is a biomedical researcher, a researcher from Stanford and his uh, group, his lab, is actually working on a lot of uh, similar initiatives in terms of the drug dis discovery and various uh, forms of extracting uh, relationships from uh, unstructured or structured research papers. So the, the purpose of this call is to start the initial uh, UX uh, ideation based on inspiration from existing platforms being, you know, uh, having the giants like PubMed and other uh, search engines that are already in place, 
there are also some smaller companies like or smaller projects or demos of how this future literature review product may look like. So there is a project that Dan Sosa uh, showed us a couple of days ago called Lion Project. And maybe we can take a quick uh, minute for Dan to kind of explain to us the nature of, of this product and what it actually does. Because for people like me, it doesn't make any sense, but I understand like what is happening here. So Dan, can, can you take, take a quick minute to, to give us the overview? Yeah, so the, the point of this uh, tool that I just Googled and found is that um, it's for something called literature-based discovery. And what that is, is you enter in a couple of terms and these terms are from controlled vocabularies in, in different biomedical ontologies. So you see chemicals, diseases, mutations, genes. So we have some kind of specification of how these genes are related to each other, how these drugs are related to each other. So with this tool, you can enter in two terms from these controlled vocabularies. So like hydroxychloroquine and MERS, for example. Um, and what it does is it finds you these intermediates. So these things that are concepts that are closely related to both of these concepts. And they could be like an interesting um, intersection of these different kinds of like fields of literature, essentially about the two concepts that you search for. Um, so, well, I guess what's nice about this tool and how this is relevant for what we're trying to build is like the UI is pretty, um, pretty similar to something that we could potentially do, like uh, displaying a knowledge graph in the same way the user can enter in like control terminologies like hydroxychloroquine, and then you can have a little graph that's interactive and you can click on the notes and maybe those notes have different functions like initiating a search for papers or something like that. But um, it's just a demo of how uh, something that could be, it could uh, inspire UI. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, from my perspective, this tool is a, is a very uh, kind of general um, type of tool that helps uh, the process of discovery of different relationships between uh, different uh, vocabularies or ontologies and it also shows the occurrences which is nice and basically um, it, it doesn't mean that we have to do the same type of interface I actually think our interface should be kind of reversed in the way that we start from um, you know exploring the the um, this, these controlled vocabularies but then we get into specific uh, papers and then we see, you know, the co-occurrences and all kinds of uh, relationships to that article. But that's also something that we really need UI UX uh, people to help us because all of these pieces, they kind of already exist in our infrastructure. And it's really about figuring out the, <clears throat> the ideal flow of uh, interactions that leads to the success state. And the success state um, obviously is also an open-ended problem but maybe you Dan can describe the ideal world scenario when someone you know types in certain um, controlled vocabularies and gets some form of aha moment just a random example maybe I mean the thing that the it seems like the Rockefeller researchers kept bringing up is like if the researcher enters in a couple of uh, a couple of genes um, for some query about some maybe disease, but they're missing that other genes are also relevant um, for the set of papers that they would be interested in reading, then this tool could maybe like inform them that there is another gene they should be searching for that would help them return more results. Um, that, that's kind of one random example. But basically yeah. it's like you're entering a couple of search terms and like there are other key search terms that will help you discover more things. Um, that are relevant and it kind of suggests that. Yeah, so I think this idea of kind of <clears throat> ex, uh, expanding from a, a controlled vocabularies to more, um, more broad uh, engrams or like um, things that are related is a good way to, to start the UX. And then the aha moment, what I mean by aha moment is like, how does it 
let, let's imagine that someone finds um, the correlation of some genes or like genes and substances or something like how does the researchers apply it uh, after that the discovery? Um, Hypothetically. I guess this helps them like it depends why they're searching in the first place if it's for like a like a systematic review or something then i guess this helps them find more things related or if they're trying to form a research question then i guess this helps them like quickly search through literature um, makes sense so systematic review i think is an important uh, point to focus on because essentially what, what we're capable of is uh, taking a very diverse set of scientific literature. Uh, we can start with CORD-19, which is already 180,000 uh, scientific papers about COVID-related stuff. And um, at first, broaden the direction of research, but then narrow the scope of literature that they have to um, you know, read and analyze. And essentially, um, uh, let me share my screen back, um, this kind of graph of things illustrates that progression. So we have CORD-19, 180,000 papers. We have direction of research. Someone comes in and types in uh, angio uh, angiotensin receptors, viral agents. Then they have a much broader scope of things that, that might be uh, relevant to them based on these uh, keywords, like the inhibitors, uh, blockers, and all kinds of things. They can basically navigate the space and select which things they, they are interested in and maybe even discover things that they didn't know they should be interested in. And then uh, as a result, they can narrow it, narrow it by collections, by being, give me all the papers that are clinical trials or give me all the papers from China or give me all the papers from British Medical Journal and etc. Basically an infinite amount of collections that we may um, create uh, as, as this decentralized open source vehicle. So basically, if someone thinks that we should have a collection of papers that have negative sentiment on Twitter, they can create it. And that can become a useful filtering options for researchers. So then, as a result, they get to a point where they see these papers and see very specific data points for those. So if it's, if it's clinical trials, obviously the things that they're interested in, sample size, age, study design, sex, and others, but also- Is this, is this where the kind of model behind Corona Med starts to come in? Yeah. That's the point where we'd, we'd go from, this is the you know, information, this is the breakdown, this is the summary, and then to the point where like, now this is the tables of information, and then separately probably, the links to the actual documents that they're wanting that are connected to that summary of information. So the first part is a understanding where people want to look. And then the second bit is like, now you've looked, this is what we've come. This is what AI has stripped out of this information and summarized it in a table form. Yeah, exactly. Because essentially we're kind of like going from broad, going into narrow, but then going broad and then super narrow. So uh, at the end, ideally we present 100 papers that are super relevant and we present an actual extraction, whether it's um, annotations done by medical professionals or it's the results that are done by the extraction uh, by the machine learning models. So the work of, for example, uh, Ty's team, which is the extraction of sample size, all kinds of quantitative data like incubation periods is essentially an automated way to present those tables. And um, this is where the human in the loop part comes in. And ideally we have a pool of medical annotators that are able to both fix the machine learning generated uh, data uh, and also introduce new kinds of um, data so they can actually review the paper if they are willing to do their own literature review process and create tables from scratch. And, for... and then very same people would hopefully then uh, influence our, our collection building side of it as well, like different filtering methods. So they might be going, actually it would be interesting if I could look at British medical journals that use sample data from China as a specific yeah. subgroup 
and they, they're the ones that are going to go, actually, that's something I can't see right now and would be useful or is something that I, f I think would be interesting. And then that sort of dialogue between them two sides of the conversation will hopefully make new focus things rather than try and make the whole thing, try and be able to do everything, build more of like build the, the filter collections as the needs require them rather than trying to make every collection that could exist. Yeah, an infinite, uh, an infinite task. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that's that's going to be the magic of the op like kind of open science collaboration because essentially scientists may create these like collections that are relevant based on the timing. Like for example, right right now researchers might be super interested in some specific uh, geographical area plus the type of papers plus something that mentions I don't know neurological. Um, consequences of COVID-19. And then that becomes, um, you know, a viral collection of, of sorts because they start sharing it on Twitter. Yeah, because and... other people step up and go, actually, this is a really interesting collection with really interesting sourced data that then other researchers can then go back and use that data set to investigate elements of it. And then a conversation is built around a collection of things that nobody really thought of to associate until someone did. Yes, that sounds clever. Yep. So I'll, I'll shut up at this point and uh, let you guys uh, um, talk. I would like to add something to what you showed, uh, Arthur, because uh, <clears throat> you make it look like it's a single step uh, or three step process to go from the keywords to the, to the data extraction. But I think it should be represented more like there can be multiple iterations instead of trying to nail it down with the single yeah. search, you can go and refine because that's how you will extract uh, the actual knowledge by refining uh, a quickly constructed uh, query, something yeah. that you can do with three or four clicks and then fine tune it until you reach the result, not try to build a complex query from scratch like uh, Dr. Evidence does or uh, any of the other uh, I mean, in some ways, this very same sort of idea exists when people shop. I mean, I don't want to simplify it, but you go, <laughs> yeah. shop, you, go, you, go, you go shopping for a pair of shoes. You're like, I don't know what shoes I want. And then you're like, actually, I'm looking for trainers. And then you go, well, what kind of trainers? Actually, I really like the look of that brand. So I'm going to just isolate just that brand. And then you go, well, I'm more interested in dark colors than light colors. So you refine that again. And then you go, oh, well, what so I, you know, shoe size am I? You filter by shoe size. And then that stages of filtration gets to a smaller and smaller list of more useful yes, But it's not a stacked. It's a iterative. It's a... You can end up not looking for trainers in the end because you see oh, yeah. something else that draws you other. It's not additive. Well, so we won't have ads. So that's a great addition to this flow. I mean, <laughs> it's def I, mean I, I, can, I can see an element of like that subtractive. I'd consider that can subtractive filtering. It's just taking bits and bits away until you get to the bit you want. And I can definitely understand. We just, we just need to accept that there's going to be a number of different flows to go through this process. It's not going to be like, yeah, like do this step, then that step. It, there will be stages and some of them stages will look like each other, but um, it's just about refining and we're going to have to work out different approaches to refining to go through that data because yeah, a biomedical person might go from look for a certain thing in a certain way. We need to understand the flow, which goes back Re into you. Refinement, uh, refinement might be broad in the result set to narrow it down somewhere else. So you yeah. have a set of well, 10 results, you, you broaden it to something that is 100, and then you end up with 10 different ones. But um, if I mean, this like, is interactive... Arthur, uh, yeah, Arthur said that literally, the idea is like, you start with a broad idea and then you'd, then you'd narrow down and then inside that you might broaden out again and then you'd even more narrow down. It's yeah. a case of there would be, it's, a, it's, definitely it's going iterative. to be an ebbing and flow between, yeah, it's going to be iterative and it's going to be moving in and out and it's going to be, mm -hmm. you can, yeah, you click into one thing and it should go, well, I'll go back a step and I'll click on a separate thing and I'll go back a step and, oh, actually that's an interesting area that, you know, it's just going to be like. Yeah, and if through, someone is curious what, why I call this directed acyclic graph, like even though we, it's very complex to show this as a, you know, acyclic graph, but essentially the, the idea is that it, it is in a way interconnected and iterative. It, 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 
So it's a system I, dynamic. Yeah, it's a system dynamic map. Yeah. So I mean, obviously, we can't represent the this image as uh, you know this flow as this, but in in reality, it will be like that. Um, so may maybe we can switch to the uh, second topic on the agenda, which is uh, discuss user stories draft by Darshan. Um, is Darshan here on the call? Uh, I don't think so. Well, I had a call with him and he's a senior product manager, software engineer, and he volunteered to start uh, the user stories draft for us to kind of uh, have at least some structure in how users will be able to, to use the system. So we'll just wait uh, for him to, to send that later today whenever he can. Uh, but the idea is to start the, the process. The second, uh, the third item on the agenda is discuss transi transition from Corona Map demo to an actual product. And this is where I put Yason in, in a way, and I'll let you talk about this. Sorry, I have some I'll share uh, the the current progress. And maybe I'll give a quick intro. So Corona Mad is actually an attempt of us uh, taking the Kaggle literature review efforts, the manual uh, efforts, and putting them into some form of a web app. So it's uh, searchable, it's queryable, it's sortable, and you can navigate it way easier than just a, a plain spreadsheet. So essentially, if if you would imagine the, the progression of this tool, ideally uh, people uh, would go here and, and ask questions like, can uh, the virus do something, blah, blah, blah. And they will find these key scientific questions that other researchers are interested in and are already doing the manual annotations. So if you would open that, that would open all the literature view tables for specific um, papers and you would see the journal study type, sample size, and all of these things. So these are done completely manually, but we already have pieces of code that can extract sample sizes, ages, uh, samples, and all kinds of things. So that, that's basically what we have so far. You can actually add to these tables uh, using the copy paste. It's a dynamic uh, user interface. But that's, that's where this um, demo ended. Yes, and it, it will always be, it will always heavily rely on uh, manual annotations, I believe. I don't think we can uh, talk about uh, automating the, the whole process at this stage. Yeah. It, it's but, definitely a human in the loop. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe we need to, to direct the, the annotation somehow so that, uh, because if, if we start getting too many annotators working on that, uh, we need some, some ground rules established on what needs to be annotated, maybe some review of previous annotations be before adding your own or something like that will create a bit more structure because at this stage it's very difficult I think to to get sufficient uh, metadata and uh, answer answer questions in that way. Yeah I think the the goal is to kind of assume that we're working only with controlled vocabulary for now so um, even though it's ambitious to have researchers come here and ask like is there a connection between COVID-19 and Alzheimer yeah, I, I definitely, yeah, I definitely agree that starting with a limited set initially until we can make it to the point where you can just ask it anything and it'd work it out for you. I think it definitely makes more sense like the other tool you were sort of showing us earlier with, um, sorry, dogs are excitable, uh, with the, you know, the two words or three words, but maybe not just words, you could, like a, a number of words with, as basically in some ways, ideally, you know, you could start with two and you could have an extra field going more fields, three, four, five, six. But the, what would be in there would be a limited se section. It, it should be controlled. Uh, yeah, uh, you can't uh, just have everything input, at first. It should be controlled at the beginning. But uh, the annotation should always be controlled in the same manner. Because you need uh, to collect uh, hu human input uh, metadata. 
but the annotator needs to be aware or directed towards what you will be searching for, not just add comments uh, randomly. Yeah, there is a, a very good community of manual annotators. Uh, so well, data set, I think. Uh, and they have, uh, I'll find the, the link in a bit. So basically what, what they do, uh, they've already annotated like 30,000 or something papers. And uh, I mean, to me, it doesn't make any sense how it was possible, but apparently it was through an effort of a lot of like medical students and other people. And essentially they, they, have, they even have workflows. So they have workflows of how they manage this medical annotator effort collaboration. They have um, people that take on specific areas or specific types of papers. And um, I think I have some, uh, some document that outlines um, what they're doing on this website. Uh, Let's, let's is that a, in that yeah, sense, is that a little bit like is that like a little bit like a Wikipedia editor then, or different classes of Wikipedia editor? Yeah, yeah. So see, so they did forty five thousand. Oh no, they identified forty five thousand and categorized four thousand, and did eight hundred studies. I think I don't know. Anyway, so this is a cool place to investigate and um, see what kind of. Uh, me medical annotations that they're doing because essentially if we can simplify it for them and make it so that they're they can do 10x of these um, and also get other communities to collaborate and do their version of 10x that makes these numbers you know 10x too yeah it goes back to distributing yeah. that knowledge and distributing <clears throat> the work anyway there is another group uh, doing manual annotation. Uh, it's called the Society Library. They made, they're interested in claims and arguments. They did it first uh, quite a few years ago. They started on uh, climate change, but now they're working on coronavirus claims. I think it will more, be more the popular discussion around it than the medical discussion, but they are looking at not just entity identification, but claim identification. So it may be interesting for you to reach nice. out. What's the name of that? Society Library. Society Library. Okay. I think we're going to have to like crowdsource all the different things we've bumped into as a collective and make it, put it in one list of like, these are all the different groups doing almost like that group's doing this process, that group's, and, and that way when we start having to look at collating lots of different people who are doing similar efforts, then we've got at least somewhere to go we can pull from all these different pools of effort that's going on and try and concentrate. Yeah, I've seen at least into one, one more collective effort of the the medical uh, manual medical annotation efforts, including Kaggle effort, because they still have a hundred medical researchers that are annotating something. It's just they're they're working in a closed um, initiative because uh, obviously uh, these type of communities are subject to a lot of data scientists and other people reaching out to them and saying, hey, use our tool, it's better, and blah, blah, blah. So we need to make sure that we're reaching out with some uh, useful thing f for them. And uh, again, it's a chicken and egg problem because for us to create something useful, we need their feedback, but for them we to- need the problem. <laughs> we need to understand the problem before it can be fully made to so yeah. solve it. Yeah. It's, so, it's like the various uh, semantic wiki attempts that have been done in the past that in order to build a data set with uh, semantic links between the topics, you need to have some feedback on the topics, but it's the same people that use it and, uh, and populate it. So you need some loop there to, but, to integrate uh, the information. But the loop has worked for Wikidata, actually, I would argue. Wikidata is now a fully functional semantic wiki. And people yeah, are still using DBpedia, even though that was not a closed loop. It was just a kind of semantic interpretation of Wikipedia. Um, it got used. But yeah, Wikidata is more a loop. You have practitioners using it and improving the data. Maybe integration with Wikidata is something to look at. I mean- I think we already, I think we already are running Wikidata and through the interface with the system. 
in the sense that somebody's already made a, a Corona Y wiki data and started putting the link, some of the links to some of our systems into their system. So there is a backlink, but I'd have to run it by Slava to check if that's like still. That's live. great. That's great if it's but the it's, case. That's already, it's already been a question and already been something that's been discussed because we understand that Wikidata is doing a really good thing and we want to try and make sure that we're going to assist them with machine readable information because there's no point making all this work and then machines not finding it. It kind of defeats the point of the work, <laughs> or at least some of it. Right. Is, is it possible? I was thinking more of exporting some of the information to Wikidata, but I don't know if that's on the agenda. Yeah, I think that Charlie Hoyt is actually someone who created our Wikidata something. So sorry, uh, I, I am new here, so I will. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I had no clue. Also, so it's always, it's always nice to have new people. It's really nice to see so many people on in one chat for once. It's been a while since I've seen a full one. Yeah, very excited. So uh, yeah, well, probably worth checking in with uh, Charlie and Slava on the Wikidata because I also have no clue like wh what's happening there. And I'll, I'll actually tag you, Mark Antoine, on this thread that I just found and Tyler, because that might be relevant. Okay, cool. So yeah, to, to sum it up in terms of transition from the CoronaMAD demo to an actual product, I think where CoronaMAD, uh, as Tyler pointed out, starts appearing is actually at the end of this process where you've already like narrowed, broadened, narrowed, broadened and reached to some filtering um, capabilities. And that's where when you're interested in actually seeing the, the literature review efforts. And yeah, we, we should start thinking about how to present this last step of tables in the yeah, most- at the, Yeah, at the end of that, it would be a case of like a button that says rent you know show me show me the data tables or something which would go to a separate page where they it would be laid out not necessarily the exact same as corona the corona yeah. method, but at least something in that shape in that sort of layout because we've already we've already discussed with them um, well some of the researchers have said that like they use spreadsheets a lot of them use spreadsheets for when they're doing it because so having it like a spreadsheet but just more flexible absolutely makes sense it's, we want to make it as usable and familiar as possible but also be more. Yeah, and the, the thing is that uh, the thing that we ha will have to overcome is the reality that we're not able to publish full text uh, papers from the court 19 because essentially they were only shared to be uh, you know consumed as the JSON and the, the actual raw data. Uh, but I think what we can do is build a similar thing that Google Books did which is um, showing you only a part where you know, certain things happen to be discovered. Or like, let's say, um, let me give an example with this one. So can the virus be transmitted asymptomatically, blah, blah, blah. And there is a study link. Um, and fortunately, this paper is open, right? But majority of papers are under the paywall of uh, different journals. So essentially, if a researcher wants to clarify or is interested in this, he should have some form of lens or like, uh, you know, a search icon where he clicks and can see um, where this data is coming from. Um, and it's, it's probably somewhere here. And I think that's going to be an important piece to simplify the, the literature review process for people too. Yeah, that's, that's kind of where we're starting to get into this topic around open science and discoverable science now, don't we? We're kind of into that yeah. space where we need to get as much open. This put, like, not being funny, but anybody who's paywalling this right now is, is literally impeding scientists. And, you know, you know and I'm not, I'm not going to pretend like it don't cost any money to do it, but, you know, it just, it's, it just baffles me how anybody would paywall something that people are trying to work on to save lives, but I suppose everything is trying to save lives. So by that logic, they'd never pay well anything just about. Yeah. Which I'd be I fine mean, with. <laughs> Essentially what we want to achieve is in the short term and in the long term to integrate in the existing ecosystem of all these, um, you know, entities, be it journals or universities and make sure we're not, you know, hurting their business in, in any way because we should respect uh, you know, hundreds of years of history of 
medical journals and hey you know medical journals actually started as an open science initiative so like yes it, it went into different directions because of the you know uh, nature of of the current world and the 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 things that we're observing but uh, we we should try as hard as possible not to um, you know work against them but work with them and hopefully showing things like like google books does just like excerpts uh, instead of full text will satisfy that uh you know um, lack of disruption of their business models one problem that i immediately see with that is that uh, if we're going to go public on the annotation platform as well how can this be how can we put the full text there yeah and we we can't and i think for the annotations uh those researchers will have to have either access through their university or their um you know scientific infrastructure or something because many of them do uh, i mean medical students have access to that through university and maybe then sosa can tell us a little bit of like how it's done because i have no clue but i assume he has access to many of these. Yeah, I have access through like my academic email and stuff, but I do agree that this is going to be a, a big challenge. It's a legal issue it's mostly. Gonna be, it's, not, uh, it's going to be a big yeah, licensing sure. issue. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a big, you know, copyright access. And, and if I won't mind, if, it's pretty weird that they've released it with stipulations that it can only be released in this form through the JSON so it can be searchable and findable but it's not releasable in a more human readable form. I just find that really weird how they've gone to the effort of like, yeah, you can have some of it sometimes, but not quite all of it. Well, the, the assumption is that machines will come in and save us from COVID. So no one needs to read anything. JSON is enough. <laughs> uh, I'm joking, obviously, but um, th this is unfortunate reality that we have to, to deal with. And let's, let's just accept that for now until we have a better version. Um, and also, I, uh, th that COVID graph thing that you, Tyler, sent over, it actually has some other data set that people assembled uh, that I think is more open and has no attachments in terms of licensing issues. I know there's been uh, effort for years by, like, pirate scientists who have been like act actively releasing their own stuff in public spaces or there are a number of like open data platforms that are there trying to open data, open, open, open on, on paying wall data science repositories and the like. So I know there are some efforts to try and I like the circuit, yes, yeah, circum and circumvent some of the paywall limitations. But I'm not sure how legal some of them are. I really don't know. Like, question, I'm, like, I don't know if it's a completely like accepted thing. If it's like it's just accepted, but technically illegal, but nobody enforces it. I don't know where where it lives well, in the legal space. This part makes me think that you know it has a buy-in from journals somehow. And obviously, we need to understand what are the consequences of us using it. But I mean, if Harvard, if NIH are, are using it, uh, that there must be some form of uh, validity to this legally. I think that depends individually on how the um, researchers publish with the journals. So if they have a right to republish their own work, then they can, they can decide to put it into these free websites as well. Um, so I would think it is legal. I don't know how much checks they do to see if the people who put their papers into these free websites actually had the right to do so. Yeah. Makes sense. That's kind of the, that's kind of the question that I, I know it's been happening for a long time, and I know researchers have done some of it, and researchers who work in universities have been like troving and adding to the public data set because you know for the moral reason of it actually is needs to be existed in the data in the open public set. But I'm not completely sure how legal it is. You know, in, in, in like it's, totality. It's different in different countries. It's different in different countries. It's sometimes even different different universities within a country. Yeah. Depends on the intellectual property agreements that the researchers sign. 
with the university as their employer. Makes sense. Well, this is something to explore and probably, I mean, <laughs> I've mentioned it many times, but we need a lawyer. So <laughs> we need a few. We need a few, definitely. We yeah. need like intellectual property lawyers. We need lawyers who have no, know the education space. We need lawyers who know the yeah. scientific publishing space. And we need ones that know governance. non-profit space. Go governance and non-profit spaces too. I you have know, a fancy no. book, How to Start a Nonprofit, now uh, as we're embarking on that uh, mission. Uh, but look, like I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm the last person that, that should be doing this because I have no clue. And honestly, I'm, I'm trying very hard to find a lawyer for us to um, formalize this, but maybe at least if we can come up with a list of types of lawyers that we need, and maybe Tyler, since you just listed out majority of those, that would be a good start. So then we can reach out to the network and be very specific. We need this lawyer, like we need IP lawyer because we are open source, but we don't want to like, create things that will be misused for different non-scientific purposes or just um, hidden hidden away you know last thing i want is someone to abuse somebody to take a tool we make that's amazing and a gift to humanity and then someone takes that most of that tool it puts a nice skin on it adds a new element and then hides all of our work behind a paywall and it's like yeah i think that, that's, that's the last thing i'd want that's the last thing, but I don't think that's the worst thing. The worst things are... Oh, no, there's definitely worse. There's like, yeah, there's, there's dangerous things that can happen with this. You know, you could be troving through, you're using the same technology to extract information and be using it for spying or something that's like way yep. worse. <laughs> yep, exactly. So that's, that's why we need uh, IP lawyers a ASAP. Um, okay, so let's let's continue with the next piece, which is discuss infrastructure pieces to exist for web developers and data scientists. And Slava is not able to join us, but he sent us a link to the um, updated uh, Corona Y data infrastructure. So um, this is great because he listed out all the possible things, including the uh, API, the Elasticsearch, Android tool, the Cano, Jupyter no notebooks, so that uh, people, people can actually run a notebooks on our system without limitations of Colab or Kaggle or any things. We have like things like OCR service and all kinds of things. So it's, it's amazing. And um, there is access to data sets. All of this is the effort to create the centralized, um, well, centralized, decentralized data commons because everyone can add, add to it and uh, everyone can use it. So very exciting stuff. Um, the link is in Slack, so um, probably we can skip to the next point. The next point is discuss NLP AI integration pipeline by Maya and Anton. Uh, let's see if, um, oh, Maya is, is in here. Maya is here. Maya is here, but I don't know if I'm Tom. I am here. I don't know if you can hear me. Yep. We can definitely oh. hear you. What's up? I think Anthem just in case. Um, but yeah, the, the part to discuss here is we have a lot of different NLP and AI pieces flowing around in different teams, including you know teams like TaskVT branched out into many different initiatives. Uh, for example, the, the only ones I'm aware of are Charlie Hoyt's team uh, with the drug repositioning. Sorry. Uh, and um, Maya's team is working on the neural network to analyze uh, basically the quality of paper, right? Maya, maybe you can give us a, a quick like intro. It's, it's, it's not a quality of, like, yeah, it's quality of the paper, but basically uh, when researchers, uh, when researcher browses the papers, and especially when it happens, uh, when he has to support uh, his idea, <clears throat> Uh, from the sciences, sciences that are related to his research, but not exactly his field, okay? And it happens a lot. Uh, then, like, you need to kind of evaluate the quality uh, of the article that you are looking at. And uh, you kind of should, you know, become an expert to really, like, you know, uh, 
to really understand if it's that, is this article good or bad. Also, you have to read through, you have to analyze, you have to, like, if you want to find a high quality article that is not just relevant, but also reliable for a quotation or other pur purposes, then you waste a lot of time trying to make this basic evaluation, but actually most of it can be done just automatically, not in a very sophisticated way. It's pretty easy to do. Yeah, exciting stuff. And basically all of these pieces have to somehow integrate in, into the, the pipeline of this uh, uh, DAG of, of like the graph of different iterations um, for literature review. And um, yeah, probably it's worth syncing up, you know, Anton, Maya, Slava, and uh, I can join that call and figure out how we can build um, pipelines to integrate these different pieces into port 19 as metadata layer or, or something. But th this is more on the technical side of things. Okay. So the, the next point is discuss needed people and how to find them. Uh, UI UX designers, medical annotators, marketers, and I'll let Bianca and Shirley, if she's here. No. So I'll let Bianca lead this one. Um, yep, so we have a list of people with the requirements that we understand so far. Um, from our existing community, I have reached out to the developers and the designers via Slack. And uh, responses haven't been many because a lot of them joined early and are probably not very active on the Slack community anymore. So the next step is to reach out to them via email and give them a little bit of information why we would like them to come back and invite them back in and re-engage them. Yeah, and um, we actually got three UX designers uh, yesterday. Yeah, I've seen exactly, in the last 24 hours, I've seen three new UX UI designers who've turned up. So I'm assuming that's probably what Bianca's doing because she kind of works like that. She's no, just... it, wasn't, it wasn't this time. No. That was oh, actually oh, Shrida's, organic. Uh, Shrida's oh, effort from posting on help with COVID. And uh, Yuan uh, joined us and then I had a call with her and she invited uh, a bunch of her uh, friends from UC Berkeley. So this is exciting. Yeah, so for I'm me, this, this is kind of the, yeah. I mean, it kind of, it's more of a philosophical discussion. I was, my, my approach was to go active Slack members, then inactive Slack members and then external. But uh, of course we can also do everything in parallel. Can and then I have all. some communities <laughs> that we get into as well, specifically for developers. Yeah, cool. So yeah, plenty of uh, things to figure out. I would say that since we got UI UX designers, it's it's just a matter of engaging them. And maybe you, Tyler, can. Yeah, I'm gonna forward. I'm I'm gonna have to see if I can go on again a call and we can start putting a mirror board together and start building um, the well. Yeah, we've we started a mirror board for like the community management stuff. This is like a tool, so we're gonna have yeah. to build a new mirror board for the process of how we would research this and where we need to get research and like start building some understanding of user stories and we need to just more than anything we just need to work out well we've already looked a little bit we need to look at competition try and understand what competition is doing well and what's not competition you know what doing well what we can learn from it isolate and understand them and then move on from that to try and get some examples and some researchers people who actually do it try and get some conversations with them so we can get some more focused detail and then the challenge come up with a, that come up a wireframe, wireframe that answers all them questions is the, that's the yeah. process. The holy grail. The challenge that we're going to face, and I faced it yesterday when talking with Yuan, um, is that, you know, the typical UI UX designer is so far away from the scientific uh, world and research and literature view process that we need someone on our side of things to, to guide them. And hopefully you, Tyler, can can lead that one. So yeah, I'm gonna. I, I'm. I basically I've been thinking that that's gonna. It's gonna happen at some point. And I'm not uh, a, a data scientist, but I've got enough of an understanding. I know what we're trying to do. So that's yep. kind of the translation point needed for it. So that's yep. kind of where I'm going to be looking at it. Exactly. All right. So um, and we'll definitely need marketers and people that are called business development people. But in, in reality, like there, there is no business. So it's like relationship 
uh, developers uh, because essentially we want to make sure that our efforts are um, you know tested or uh, proven not just by individuals but by entities be it universities or groups of researchers or um, even private companies like if there is a <clears throat> for example the the major clients of Dr. Evidence are pharma uh, corporations and they are in a in a desperate need of uh, tools like this and obviously this is where the sus sustainability may come from because they may uh, be able to ask for some you know consulting or like services that we can tailor to them or integrate with their systems and that can potentially bring us some um, you know long-term viability in terms of fi financial aspect of things because even though we're building open source and open science tool, we'll have to make sure that we have a focused effort and people are able to dedicate their time to it, which means it has to integrate into monetary type of economy. And that means we, we need money to, to sustain that effort. So that kind of brings me to uh, another point that I put as the last one, um, which is discuss funding and sustainability and the World Economic Forum support. So we recently uh, submitted to the Uplink initiative of, um, of uh, World Economic Forum. And that's just one of many opportunities for, um, for support and funding and mentorship of different projects. And I think I forgot to send a link, but uh, basically it's, yeah, the crowdsourcing innovation to address the wor world's most pressing challenges. And uh, apparently they're able to help with all kinds of funding and um, philanthropy uh, type of uh, support. And there are many different connections that may happen as a result of it. So we, we took a step and submitted a very rough application that we're planning to fine tune in the coming days. But the question is, how do we reach uh, sustainability without sacrificing our open science mission and open source mentality. And that's something that I put uh, Wout and Jack Park. Uh, Jack is not able to join, unfortunately. So I'll let Wout uh, quickly brief us uh, on that. I think you're muted. No? Definitely yeah. muted, sir. Okay, I mean, What's the question? <laughs> the question. Yeah. yeah, the question. It, it all starts with a, the right question. And the, the question is, obviously there are many things uh, to, to focus on in terms of uh, sustainability and the short term and the long term. And we're exploring different kind of like grants or be it scientific grants or philanthropies or foundations supporting us. Um, the, the diagram that Wout initially created mapped out all kinds of different stakeholders from the perspective of where capital exists right now. And uh, we all shared different perspectives and experiences working with different sources of capital. And even though I come from venture capital background and I've been building startups for, for years, I don't have a strong belief that uh, we should raise venture capital money for, for many reasons, because typically it leads to, um, you know, loss of control. But there is a, another breed of venture capital investors called impact investors that might be beneficial to what we're doing, because they are not investing just for the sake of, you know, 10x or 100x returns, but also for the public good of society. And um, I'll let Wout kind of uh, scan through this diagram here on the call. And the question is, how do we make sure we exist and work at, at full speed in the long term? Okay, well, quite a challenge. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I'm not sure if I'll walk through the, the diagram. Uh, maybe I'll come to that. Yeah. Uh, my starting point is, um, we we responded to the the, the challenge of the, the pandemic COVID nineteen pandemic the Gaggle challenge. Um, we're working globally distributed, all kinds of disciplines and expertise, uh, more or less the same intention and focus. 
aiming, we're aiming high. We, we're, we're aiming at, at, at contributing to solutions for, for global challenges. And now specifically for, for the, the, the COVID-19. So that calls for global partnerships. That, that calls for, that, that implies that you actually are not um, uh, operating in the field of business transactions common goals that are more or less more public. So um, that implies that the type of, of funding, financial reward, whatever you may call it, you might expect that is aligned with that mission is more public uh, than, than, than private capital. So that's, that's the starting point. Um, well, I added also as a layman, let's let's for the time being um take this this course um strive for a mix of of the various uh, financing construction so maybe indeed uh, paper use or uh, specific contracted work that might be fine beneficial by for 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 commercial entities but in general we seek those platforms, those collaboratives that are um, focusing on the same global challenges are in a way this, this, this hybrid in terms of various sectors and entities, types of organizations are there gathered and, and well engage and see if we can be of service have resonance at least on what we state that our, our purpose is and our principles are and stick to that uh, and see if indeed that will, like Jack put it so very eloquently, start the ball rolling uh, that we can get traction and in the process we're, we're trying to use um, our network for that. Um, so, question is: Is that a an answer to your question, uh, Arthur? You like me to elaborate elaborate on some things? Yeah, I uh, think it's it's a good start of the discussion, and obviously okay. we won't be able to solve it here in five minutes. But I think that gives a, a quick overview into the the lines of thinking, at least for for what we have to think through and the complexity of the landscape that we should be thinking about because this is one of those decisions because you know in in our four months period we've done many things and moved fast and broke things and when you're dealing with code that's fine but when you're dealing with attracting funding you cannot go back so making sure that we we get the right type of support right type of uh, partners and this is uh, very important as well as you know, making sure that we're we have a lawyer to to help us with these type of uh... yeah. I mean, if we if we end up taking financial support from a place that undermines our values or our system or our you know our, our way of as an organisation we identify ourselves, it's going to undermine the entire work we do in every single way. So we've got to really be careful where money comes from. And if the money comes, it makes sure that the strings attached are strings that we're happy with and they're, they're not undermining the message. Because like you say, I, I I've, got no problem with, yeah, I've got no problem with an impact investor coming on because they see what we're doing and they've got places in them they're making money from and they've got spare money that they don't intend to make money from, but they want to make an impact with. Like the, the changes, the, it changes the impact, not the financial reward. I, I, that, as long as their ideals and our ideals match, no problem at all. But if someone turns up going, well, I want a ten, you know, I want a one percent return a year or five percent return a year, I'm like, well, that's not what we do. <laughs> we can't really see any return because we're about solving problems. Um, I, I um, put a message in the funding channel prior to our uh, submission to the Uplink uh, platform, and that was to make explicit that we must. And I think we are, I am certainly be aware of the fact that we are engaging with indeed, uh, it was primarily initiated by the World Economic Forum, engaging with an organization, a network, a field uh, of, of actors that 
indeed we can see as a part of the old system thriving on 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 old principles that partly are healthy in terms of economic progress and and creating well-being and, and new technologies that are useful uh, um, working models that are useful in terms of efficiency and planning and charting etc and that are unhealthy parts i'm very aware of that that might be my background but at some point we have to engage with those systems what i call not well, generally old systems that are in a way or stuck or in dire need of escaping from a context a paradigm that doesn't work anymore we are very much aware of that that's why corona why is so but we cannot create a, uh, let's say a future without the the present and the present contains also these organizations where we are very much aware and that's that's part of let's say the approach and and conversations which are really stuck in old beliefs and old values that that we cannot adhere to yeah. and which can liberate so to speak or attract indeed I mean, yeah. permanently yeah. very putting our purpose out there and and stating our principles on great and yeah exactly yeah i mean rome wasn't built in a day but it, it definitely wasn't, but at the same time, the principles, uh, the principles that hopefully hold us all together and try and make us focus on solving the problems. You know, you, you don't burn all the bridges. It, it's just not a smart way to get anything done. Because if you burn all the bridges, then you then you're on an island by yourself and you can't get to anywhere yeah. on anything. You need to be able to go. accept that if you can if you can make a positive enough if you can make positive enough change in systems that are old then they may change because lots of things are adaptable and they are changeable. We need to not assume that the entire system is intransient because if it, the whole thing's intransient, no matter what we do, we're not going to change anything. So there's no point even trying. We're all coming here with a place of optimistic hope that things can change for the better because otherwise none of us would be here. We wouldn't be here if we didn't believe something could be made a difference of. So we have to hope that the, the, the stuck things are not, not an intransient they're just difficult to move and we need to show them that the movement can be made and they can support us in our movement to to help them change as well yeah what a beautiful statement to to wrap this up i i unfortunately have to jump another call right. huh? <laughs> i was just gonna say we skipped over the roadmap so i'll just share the link yeah because, um, because for this engagement we need a roadmap to be ready it's, it's very very high level but it's yeah. a starting point that I made and we touched on all nice. the things on the roadmap. No access and, though. And I would create a Trello board from that next bit so we can. Amazing. Can you, can you share access by the link? Sorry? I, I don't have access. What? Yeah. How strange. But yes, Trello board sounds amazing. I think there are a couple of things to put in there already. And you know, roadmap is the, the first one and Oh, nice. Product ideation, MVP design development, launch preparation. This is amazing. This is very much focused on how do we get something out there as quickly as possible. And it's very much not representing the massive amount of work that is part of the development process. Yes. This is simple sentences explaining complicated problems. <laughs> <laughs> this is very, great. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much right. for, for putting this yeah. together. So. Thank you. Let's, um, I'm not sure if we'll continue doing the daily calls. I think that might be too much for the current stage of this initiative, but let's sync in a couple of days and work on the Trello and the roadmap asynchronously. And also, you know, uh, kind of like go through all the things that we discussed here in terms of needs and start those as action items on Trello. Sounds good. Sounds great. Thank you, everybody, for joining. It's been really nice to see some faces and hear some points of view. And hopefully next time we can get a bit more a broader consensus and see if we can get some more points of view, more ideas from people. But, uh, it's been really nice to see everybody's faces again. I agree. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Thank thanks everyone. Okay. Bye. Goodbye.